And welcome to this installment of our industry leadership series. I'm Brian Dobson, Head of Disruptive Technology Equity Research at Chardin Capital Markets. As always, I'll start this call on a interesting and provocative note with some important disclosures. Uh, during this call, we will not be discussing Chardin research. Any discussions about research should be coordinated between a participant and their respective salesperson. Our compliance team has also asked me to read this statement for the investor call. By participating in this call, our speakers attest that they have made Chardin aware of any potential conflicts, and they will not discuss any material, non-public, or confidential information that they are aware of that may breach their legal, regulatory, or fiduciary responsibilities to any parties. So with that out of the way, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the, the, the team from CRGO. Um, and uh, gentlemen, would you uh, perhaps take a moment to introduce yourselves? Sure. Hi, I'm Tzvi Shriver, founder and CEO. Hi, I'm Ezra Gardner. I'm a director and I was the CEO of the SPAC sponsor entity. Wonderful. Uh, and I'd like to point out that we recently launched coverage of the company and our research reports are available upon request. So let's get into some of the big picture questions we have on tap for today. Uh, I guess to both of you, as you're looking at the global landscape, um, what do you identify as the mega trends that are shaping the digitization of the freight sector over the next few years? And I guess going a bit further, how have you positioned um, the, the company to prosper within that environment? Yeah, well, look, uh, Brian, the, um, to remind you, the freight industry is a very large industry, depending how you count, it's a, a trillion dollars or more. And it underlies a, a large part of the world economy. Uh, about a quarter of the world economy is global trade, and about 90% of the goods that you buy in the US are imported. So it's a huge part of the infrastructure of the world economy. Um, the thing that's most surprising for people who are not in the industry is that it's not digital already. You know, other industries, passenger travel has been digitized for at least 25 years, but actually um, has some digital routes going back much further. Uh, retail, um, you know, finance, a lot of industries have gone online. So it's quite surprising for people who are outside the industry that international freight, whether air or ocean, is only now uh, going online. Um, but uh, I think that is, the, if you ask what is the trend, I think, I think digitalization is the trend. Uh, Freightos is uh, proud to be right at the forefront of that. Uh, but it's an industry trend. You know, five years ago, when, when I went and spoke about digitalization at freight conferences, um, I was sort of the only one talking about it. And nowadays, you go to a freight conference, uh, like I did uh, last week in Long Beach, and half the, agenda, half the agenda is digitalization. So the industry has finally woken up to the fact that uh, it has to, uh, you know, enter the 21st century and uh, become digital. I totally agree with T. And the only thing I'd add is when we look towards other industries, once you start the digitalization, there, there's no looking back. It just keeps going. Yeah, that's right. I agree with you there. Um, I guess uh, as you're looking out over the industry, how would you describe your competitive landscape at the moment? How do you expect that to evolve in the coming years? Um. We're fortunate to have uh, very limited direct competition. I mean, there there are the companies who are digitalizing freight. And many of them, though, are in the sort of domestic trucking, which I consider to be a separate industry, certainly a related and, you know, a adjacent industry, let's say. Uh, but companies like uh, Transfix and many others who are digitalizing trucking are not competitors. They're in an adjacent industry. Um, in our industry, we're really the only substantial, or by far the most substantial, I would say, vendor neutral platform. Uh, there are other companies coming at digitization from a different angle. One of the most famous is Flexport, who actually are a freight forwarder. So they're, they are a vendor. They're not vendor neutral. They, they are a service provider. They ship goods, um, or they arrange the shipment of goods. Um, and they're, you know, they've raised a lot of money, and they're uh, trying to create a more digital freight forwarder, as it's called. Um, so there are other companies coming at different angles, but when it comes to being a vendor neutral uh, platform, Freightos is, is by far uh, the biggest player, I would say, in, in air and ocean, in international freight. Wonderful. Um, I suppose as you're, as you're thinking about that broader industry again, 
What would you identify as the largest near-term obstacles uh, that you see the company facing? The obstacles for the industry in general or obstacles for freight us and digitalization? Let's do both. Talk about it either. All right. Look, um, the industry as a whole is in a bit of a, a bit of a hangover, I would say, after the, the pandemic. Um, obviously, you've all seen that you also the headlines during the pandemic about supply chains getting uh, choked up because people were buying record amounts of goods. So during the pandemic, people bought more goods and, and spent less money on services. And um, the whole network collapsed, um, freight rates uh, balloons um, to a very extreme extent. Um, and now, over the last few months, it's been returning, I would say, crashing back to normal. So to give you an example, we actually publish um, some of the leading indexes for ocean and air prices. So if you look at the FBX index, the Freight Baltic Index, it's the leading index which we publish um, of the price of container shipping. You can find it on our website, data.freightos.com, or on your, your Bloomberg screens. And there's futures traded on, on CME and, and Singapore. Anyway, um, if you look at FBX01, which is sort of the most watched one, that's uh, China to the US West Coast. So that's Trans-Pacific, one of the world's most important trade lanes. Um, that was hovering the price to uh, ship a 40-foot container from China to Long Beach or to the West Coast was tending to be around $1,500 to $2,000 pre-COVID. Uh, at the peak of COVID, it was above twenty thousand dollars, so it, it was ten, uh, you know, more than well over ten x. Uh, right now, it's about a thousand dollars, so it's crashed right down from twenty thousand dollars to a thousand dollars, even lower than, than the pre-COVID. Um, so the, the good news is the the industry is working well. Um, goods are shipping on time now. Um, world trade is just as important as it ever was. Um, all the talk of, you know, we're going to niche or we're not going to source from China anymore. None of that has happened. The world trade is alive and well. The network's working well, but prices are, are uh, low. Uh, volumes are slightly soft as people spend more money on services again. Um, and of course, the industry made the mistake during the, when prices were $20,000, they ordered a lot of ships and, and planes. So there's going to be a little bit of excess capacity in the next few months. But all of that is part of the normal cycle of the industry. Overall, the industry is healthy. It's certainly going to continue its long-term growth. But in terms of the cycle, you know, because it's an infrastructure uh, industry, when prices are high, people buy cranes and ships and trucks and trains, then prices go low. So at the moment, it's on a, a you know, a down cycle in terms of pricing. Um, in terms of digitalization, um, so that was your first part of your question. In terms of digitalization, um, I would make a distinction here between air cargo and ocean, uh, if I'm going to be honest. Air cargo is now well along the path to digitalization. Now, when I say well along the path, let me put that in context. Um, less than 2% of air cargo bookings are made electronically today. So that may not sound like a lot, um, but uh, we've got airlines representing 50% of the world market at least have a digital capability. We have thousands of freight forwarders using it. It's growing every single you know, quarter, virtually every single month. Um, so you see a very clear momentum to digitalization of air cargo. And even though it's the small percentage, it will be you know, the, the best part of a billion dollars this year, booked digitally and growing very, very steadily. You can see that that's, you know, the flywheel's turning and uh, air cargo is being digitalized. Ocean, um, a little slower. There, there's still the signs, there's the start. Uh, the ocean liner industry is much uh, more consolidated, much less fragmented. The, the largest ocean liner in the world, container ocean liner, has 20% of market share. And now with all the ships they've ordered, they're going to have more than 20%. The largest airline, which is Qatar Airways, probably, uh, probably has about 6% of the world market. So it's a much more fragmented market. So in ocean, there's a few very big players. We need to wait for them to fully adopt uh, digital capabilities uh, so that's that's a uh, a challenge there even so we are seeing we're seeing clear progress even on the ocean side yeah it's certainly an exciting time in the industry and you know to your point earlier i think many investors are surprised that it's not already as digitized as you'd like it to be um you know i'd like to say one thing on that sometimes when i speak to investors <laughs> and i'm sure many of the people on the call won't uh, won't confuse this but sometimes people are thinking of sort of fedex or, or ups Sure. Um, so we're not talking about small parcels. You know, if you want to ship a small FedEx box or a UPS envelope, um, then that goes on a UPS truck and a UPS plane or a FedEx truck or, or a FedEx plane or DHL. 
they've got their own capacity for that. And that's fairly digital. You can book it on a website and, and you know how much you're going to pay and you know when it will arrive. Um, but that's a very small part of the market and not it's almost also a separate industry in a way. We're talking about big freight, full containers, uh, tons of air cargo. And even if you, I mean, FedEx and UPS also do freight forwarding, but when they send big stuff, it's not going on their planes or their trucks. And then you're in the non-digital world where, where lots of phone calls and emails. And we're, we're making progress and changing that. that. That's completely right, because that's the form of international shipping that most people are familiar with, you know, sending a package to Hong Kong or London. Um, but that doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily work the same way when you're sending an entire container. Um, Correct. Great. So let's move on to some of the company specific areas we'd like to address on the call today. Um, can you talk about the significance of adding new carriers to your platform, such as the recent addition of JetBlue, um, you know, and compare that with how you'd like to get deeper penetration with your existing carriers like Lufthansa, Qatar, British Airways? Well, both are very, very important. Um, sure. You know, the, the, at the heart of our business is a marketplace model. So let's just talk about that for a second, then I'll, I'll answer your specific question. Um, but marketplaces are very exciting businesses, some of the most valuable businesses in the world are marketplaces. And the, the great thing about a marketplace is you have this very strong uh, mutual network effect. Uh, every time you bring sellers, like in our case, every time we bring airlines, there's more supply and that attracts more buyers. And every time we bring buyers, uh, there's more demand that attracts new, new supply. So you get this wonderful flywheel of supply, attracts demand, demand attracts supply. And, and once that gets going, and, and it is it is going, um, you know, that can keep growing for decades. A very, very uh, defensible uh, business uh, marketplace. Um, so um, in that context, uh, you know, the, the adding more supply is very important. So we're growing with the existing airlines. The very first airline on our platform was Lufthansa, in, in fact. Uh, the biggest airline on our platform is Qatar, and we're growing with them. Every quarter, they get more bookings. Um, but adding new airlines is very, very important because that gets attract that's attractive to uh, to bring more buyers because they suddenly think there's new supply. And sometimes we have, you know, we may have a freight forwarder or an importer or an exporter who does a lot of trade on some trade lane where JetBlue is very, um, uh, you know, a, an excellent carrier. And maybe till now they weren't using our platform because their favorite airline wasn't on it. Um, so we're very much keen both on bringing on new airlines and growing with the existing airlines, and we do both. Uh, but bringing on new airlines is particularly important because that's the opportunity to go back to some import or export or freight forwarder whose favorite airline wasn't on the platform. They weren't using the platform and we say, now your favorite airline's on the platform. So that's very significant. Same the other side, you know, when, when if you look at the buyers who, uh, in the airlines it's normally the freight forwarders, but the ultimate buyers are, are the importers and exporters. Uh, we do both. We attract new ones and we increase uh, volume with the existing ones. And we increase volume very sharply with the, with the freight forwarders, you know, who like the travel agents of the industry. Um, when a freight forwarder, when a cohort of freight forwarders starts booking, let's say, this month in March, we know that the same cohort who start booking in March, next March, they're going to be booking four times more, um, which is phenomenal because there's no customer acquisition cost. We, we spend the money just once and it's not a huge amount. On a, on a you know phone call or a Google ad or a meeting, we spend the money once to acquire them as a customer, and then they book more and more and more. So in that respect, uh, the growth of existing buyers is particularly attractive because it doesn't cost us anything. It's just pure you know zero cost growth. Uh, but of course, uh, you know we want to we want to capture the whole world market. So bringing on new freight forwarders, even if there's a, a small customer acquisition cost, is very very important as well. That's how we increase our market share. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a great segue um, to discussing the network effect of your uh, uh, of your client base. But first, I want to uh, I want to remind everyone in the audience: if you have questions, please email them to bdobson at chardin .com, um, If you have questions that you'd like me to pose to to management, so I guess moving on um, to to that network effect question, can you talk about? how your business model aggregates buyers and users of the platform and how that might compare to like an early stage Amazon mar marketplace. Yeah, you know, our industry has many of the same characteristics as, as a you know, retail marketplace or travel marketplace. Um, you've got, if you look at the, we really deal with three levels, uh, the carriers, airlines and ocean liners, 
uh, the freight forwarders who like the, the travel agents who arrange all the shipping and then the actual importers and exporters. And we don't deal with consumers, you know, we're all B2B. Uh, the importer or exporter company is our end, is the end customer as far as we're concerned. Um, so when you look at the carriers, there's some fragmentation I mentioned earlier, ocean, ocean liners are actually not that, actually somewhat consolidated. Uh, airlines are fairly fragmented. When you go to the freight forwarders, uh, they're phenomenally fragmented. There are 100,000 freight forwarders in the world. Uh, you've got the really big guys, uh, most of them European, as it happens, DHL, Kuna Nagel, DP Schenker, DSV. These guys all do 20 billion or more a year. Um, so you've got the really big guys, but you've got a huge long tail of, of small local freight forwarders. In America, some of the biggest freight forwarders are uh, expeditors, uh, UPS's freight forwarding division, which is separate to the small parcel. Um, so very, very fragmented. So if you're an airline, very hard for you to service um, all the freight forwarders when, it, when it's so fragmented. And then you get to the importers and exporters, it's even more fragmented. Fragmented. Just in the US, there's half a million companies doing import and export, half a million. Um, in Asia, many millions of companies do import and export. So you've got the, the classic uh, situation where you need a marketplace. You've got many, you know, a lot of different fragmented supply, fragmented demand. On a given day when you need to import a, a container or you need to fly, you know, a, uh, 500 kilo or a thousand pounds by air, uh, you need to find who's got the best capacity on that day. So it's really a classic uh, marketplace situation where you need to match supply and demand efficiently at, a, at any given moment. Yeah, wonderful. And I think I think we saw evidence of that that building momentum. You know, when you imported and when you reported uh, transactions for the fourth quarter, uh, which were up significantly year over year. Uh, can you talk about some of the key drivers that that fueled that growth? And I know um, you need to be thoughtful about what you say in terms of forward commentary, but just what should investors be watching in terms of key drivers for that transaction growth? Yeah, that's um, that's a great question. And yeah, we put out the KPIs for the fourth quarter, and uh, on Monday we'll put out the financial results and, and some more analysis of the same KPIs uh, for the fourth quarter. Um, and I, I think, you know, I always say when you're looking at a marketplace, um, actually, you know, normally normally investors sort of start from the top line is the revenue and then you go to the bottom line. Uh, but in a marketplace, you really have to look first at, you know, what are called the top, top line, which is what's the volume traded in the marketplace. Um, and you look at that even before you look at the revenue. The revenue is, of course, critical, but... The revenue derives by the volume and liquidity of your marketplace, and your your defensibility derives from how much liquidity you have as a marketplace. So, I would encourage investors when they look at freighters always to look first at the volume uh, in the marketplace, and we report that in two ways: uh, the number of transactions um, and the um, value of transactions, which we call gross booking value (GBV). Some of the marketplaces, if they're dealing with goods, they talk about GMV, gross merchandise value, GBV, gross booking value. Same thing. Um, that's the value of transactions which are being you know, bought and sold in our marketplace. Um, I'd encourage people actually first to look at the number of transactions and only then at the value. And the reason for that, of course, is we discussed the fact that the prices have been very volatile. So that does affect the GBV. So um, you know, we're growing in GBV, uh, but we've got a bit of a headwind from the, from the prices dropping. When you look at the number of transactions, that, that's not influenced by the price level in the market. So it gives you the uh, purest indication of whether the marketplace is growing, uh, which it is. And um, if you see the number of transactions growing every quarter, uh, then you know you've got a healthy marketplace, which is which has figured out the formula for for you know growth, the network effect that should keep us growing uh, for many years. Yeah, I I agree with that. From an analytical viewpoint, we focus on the transactions because. Uh, it gives us a better idea of penetration in your existing clients, new client build, rather than that that nominal figure that's swinging around the cost of freight shipping, which which is outside of your control, right? Exactly. Um, so you know, as you're thinking, but as you're thinking about that that gross booking value, um, let's talk about your take rate, right? Which is the the percentage uh, fee that you charge. It's currently around one point three percent. Um, do you think that there's uh, a possibility that that may expand over time as you offer new products and services? And if so, you know, what could those products and services be? So, yes, it will, it will, it will grow over time. Um, uh, a word of caution for those who really want to understand the company in depth. 
Um, there is um, there is something going against that, and that is just the mix of uh, transactions. So that's if you're following our take rate, people may ask this year why it's not going up, and I'll, I'll explain why. It's it's kind of interesting. If you take our two main segments, the the um, what we call Web Cargo, the platform where Ford has booked with airlines, um, that's relatively new but growing very very fast. The take rate there is lower; it's actually uh, still a little below 1.3 percent, bringing down the average. Freightos.com, which is where the end customers book with the freight forwarders, is a more mature part of the marketplace. Uh, depending on a few things, we can get close to 10% um, over there. Now, the great news is in both segments, the take rate is good or even increasing. Uh, the thing that's going a bit against is the mix, that the um, air cargo is growing faster than uh, Freightos.com. And so what you'll see this year is the take rate on web cargo is definitely going up. The take rate on, on Freightos is steady, maybe even going up. But the mix um, is towards the, the part of the marketplace with the uh, lower take rate. So over time, the good news is take rates going up in both segments. The one with the lower take rate is growing faster and, and sort of preventing the, uh, you're not seeing it in the average. Uh, but the underlying trend is excellent. So, you know, take rate is improving. And it's improving for two reasons. One, you hinted at Brian, is we add more services, insurance, customs, brokerage, credit. Uh, but the other reason also is that as the marketplace becomes bigger and more liquid, it's more valuable and, and people are willing to pay more. The airlines say that, you know, this becomes an ever more important channel for the airlines and more valuable to them or ever more sourcing, ever better sourcing a platform for the freight forwarders or the importers and exporters. So as the marketplace grows, it becomes more valuable uh, in its own right, even regardless of the extra services we add. And that allows us to, to fairly take a, a higher fee over time. You know, I guess my next question, and, and we've touched on this a, a little bit, but it's important, so so we'll circle back to it. You know, both air and shipping rates have have been volatile over the past year. Um, I guess, how do you think investors should, you know, think about that? And then also, can you touch upon a few of your the indices that you offer, which I think are a great way to track, you know, price volatility in per quarter in general. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, the two main sets of indices we publish are FBX, which I mentioned earlier, the Freitas Baltic Index for container shipping, and FAX, the Freitas Air Index. Um, shipping, as I mentioned, has, has uh, crashed quite spectacularly um, on a worldwide basis, more than 80%, but Trans-Pacific, well over 90% down. Um, so that's been quite a spectacular um, crash. Uh, air, a lot more modest. It's down maybe... Uh, on average, twenty five percent, which is uh, still, you know, still a significant dip, but not nearly as dramatic. Um, this does influence, but the great news is we've been growing so fast that our GBV has, has grown even despite that uh, significant headwind. Um, and so, I think that's a strong testament to how strong the underlying growth is. That even with our headwind, we're still growing. Um, but yes, you'll see, you know, this year I'm sure that the number of transactions will grow by a much higher percentage than the value of the transactions because the value of the transactions will be still grow, I believe, but it will be influenced by the, the lower price level, which is completely, completely out of our control. Uh, revenue wise, it's a bit of a mix. We, we some, some transactions, we take a fee, which is a flat fee per transaction. So those uh, fees are fortunately not impacted when, uh, when the price level drops, uh, although they are impacted when volumes in the industry drop, but not by the price level. Other times we take a fee, which is a percentage of the value, and, and that is absolutely impacted. Like any marketplace, when, when the price level drops, uh, it will impact part of our revenue. But I'm confident that we're going to grow uh, despite those headwinds. And of course, it's cyclical. You know, maybe next year prices will come back and give us a tailwind. So as part of your go public process, uh, you raised about $80 million. Uh, where do you see yourselves deploying that capital? I think, as you'd expect, two main places, research and development and sales and marketing. So it's all about growth, growing the platform, the technology base. We have a substantial technology base. We have well over 100 software engineers. Um, and so that's the first big bucket. And the second big bu bucket is sales and marketing. It's a big world out there. Our industry is, by its very nature, a global industry. You can't do freight just in the United States or just in France. It's uh, You have to cover the world and to do it properly. Um, and so... Uh, we invest in sales and marketing. The good news I will say, and, and you'll see this again, you've seen it before, you'll see it again in our results on Monday, is we, we, make, we make a healthy gross profit. So 
Um, none of the none of the money is going into promoting uh, transactional growth directly. We put money into sales teams, yes, to, to meet with new airlines, new forwarders. That's very, a very important investment for us and for our shareholders, of course. Uh, but we are not, and Ezra often commented on this when he did his due diligence, you know, before we combined, uh, we, we are not one of those marketplaces who pay people to, to buy or to sell on our marketplace, not at all. Uh, we make a, a healthy gross profit on every transaction. Um, and then we, we invest all of that and, and a bit more in, in research and development and sales and marketing, but all from the basis of a fundamentally a, a good unit economics. Yeah, yeah, the excellent. other thing that I'll that I'll add there, Brian, is that we, we've said before publicly um, that you know we raise capital in excess of the capital that was needed for these functions. So I think that that's important in this market to give people comfort that we are fully capitalized. Yeah, very good, particularly in this type of uh, the the sentiment that's around uh, that's around the current market. Um, and I guess going back to sentiment, uh, the shares have been under significant pressure. Uh, since the DSPAC. In our recent notes, you know, we're, we won't discuss our research, but we give some reasons that we think for that in our recent notes. Um, I guess, what do you think is, is causing the selling pressure? Do you believe that there's a misperception in the market about how your company operates? Ezra, would you like to take that one or would you like Yeah, me? I mean, I, I can make a couple of comments and you can as well, but, you know, let me first say that obviously, you know, management and directors are never happy or excited when a stock breaks, breaks a deal price, particularly, and speaking from the buyer's perspective, when we believe that the deal price um, was a great value. In fact, you know, I would encourage listeners and those that are interested in the story to take a look at the publicly available uh, marketplaces out there and compare us on a GBV growth rate, compare us on a market uh, efficiency rate. And I think that that comparison will um, be an interesting analysis to see exactly you know, how fast we're growing and how much more capital efficient we are than the other industry players, and then maybe compare us on, on, a, on a multiples basis. And I think um, over time that, uh, you know, when you see our results on, on Monday and the results going forward, that you'll get a, people will get educated and get a better picture into this. You know, one of the issues, um, Brian, is that even though people understand that logistics and supply chain te technology are very, very important verticals that are be going to become more important. There aren't a lot of companies out there that are public that are doing this, as, as you can probably attest to in the research that you did. And potentially, there's an education um, um, process that needs to take place. I, I don't. I, I wouldn't point to any particular misperception, given the fact that we're six weeks old. We, we're, we're building the the perception now, um, with the one exception. I think we've talked about this alre already a lot that. How linked are we to freight rates? How linked are we to freight volumes? And I think Svi, um, you know, explained that very well. That 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 of course there is some linkage, but in a in a market where digitalization is the main trend, it's taking the greater and greater share of the pie. That that's what's going to have a bigger impact, and I think people will see that over time. One other thing I've said, and it's nothing to do with freight offs, but uh, I don't know, Ezra and Brian, if you agree with this, but I sometimes. Many people talking about the SPAC sector, uh, which is kind of, you know, or, or, which is kind of a very lazy <laughs> thing because SPACs are different. Gesher was not a typical typical SPAC, and and you know we we we've, we've got our own business, which may be very different to another company that despac. But there's no question that some companies despac with no revenue and and maybe gave a, a somehow a bad reputation. And I think investors uh, who are sophisticated, I'm sure all, all the um, people on this call are sophisticated enough to look at each individual company on its merits. Um, but there may be some people out there who just take a lazy look and say, well, you know, SPACs, SPACs aren't good or something like that and, and short a SPAC deal without taking the time to actually learn about the specific SPAC and the specific uh, target, which, uh, so I don't know if you agree with that or not, but it seems to be a bit of a, no, I, a, a I, bit I, of a I, trend I, there. I, I do agree with that. It's also a personal pet peeve of mine when people characterize it as, oh, you know, despect companies are down this much, as if you were talking about industrials or healthcare. Um, and and you know, it, inside of that, inside of that group, there's a a wide, you know, wide swath of business operations models. Some very good, some very bad, and certainly current sentiment is treating them, I think, all pretty poorly. Um, which, you know, creates opportunities in certain cases, I, I believe. Um, so speaking about opportunities, 
how would you compare and contrast yourselves to the online travel agencies that, that people are really familiar with those platforms, right? Like Expedia, like Booking.com. Um, and certainly as someone that spent a, a, a significant amount of time analyzing those companies in that industry, um, I see a lot of similarities here uh, between your business and the early stages of, uh, you know, call it the bookings or Expedia. But I guess, how, how do you think about that? I think that's right. I mean, of course, there are nuances of difference. I mean, we're more B2B, they're more B2C, so it's not exactly the same. But in many respects, there are similarities. And in fact, you know, the biggest part of our transactions is with airlines. And most mostly it's the same airlines who, who you know, sell on Expedia. Of course, there are a couple of specialist uh, cargo airlines, but the majority of the bookings that are uh, done on our platform or going on a passenger aircraft in the in the lower you know the lower deck as it's called um so that's a very clear similarity a lot of the supply is actually coming from the very same companies from a different department um i think one of the advantages <laughs> there's a there's a very important difference though which actually works in our favor in a way um which is when when expedia and, and then you know price and booking came along um there was a digital infrastructure uh, two companies mainly called saber and amadeus uh, Sabre goes back to the 60s, uh, was started by American Airlines, Amadeus goes back to the 80s. So uh, somebody had already done um, at least the behind the scenes. Yeah, selling online was new, but the connecting all of the supply to a single digital platform, that had been done decades before. And that meant that the barrier to entry was not so high. Anybody could take a subscription to Sabre Amadeus, build a website, and in fact, many did. I mean, you know, you've got now they, they sort of bought each other, but you've got Expedia and there was Travelocity and Orbitz and Skyscanner and, and uh, Kayak and and some of them emerged and some of them haven't. But the barriers to entry as an online travel agent were actually very low because the digital infrastructure was there. Um, in freight, it's not like that. There is no Sabre. There is no Amadeus. The closest thing is our own Web Cargo um, uh, you know, subsidiary, which is really like the Sabre or the Amadeus. So, uh, so we have some unique um, digital infrastructure and a, a unique network. And so the barriers to competition are much, much higher than they were for the online travel agents. And I think that gives us a, a unique uh, opportunity. I, I might add one analogy or thought problem, Brian, for the, the listeners. So next time you walk on to an airplane, onto the, I'll say the top of the airplane, you know, look around and try and guess how many of the passengers on there booked those tickets electronically versus, um, you know, with email and uh, uh, phone calls, um, and you'll probably guess correctly that it's all of them um, on, on the plane. And then if you, you know, look down at your feet and you can just imagine below you that there's a bunch of cargo on that very, very same plane, and you ask yourself the same question, how much of that cargo was booked digitally? The answer is probably very little. But then ask yourself the question, if you can project yourself into the future a few years, how much of it is going to be booked digitally? And I think the answer is very analogous and, and people will come to the, the right conclusion. I I think that that's a I think that that's a great example. Um, and it's it's been my experience that when you can draw an investment case um, so simplistically, it usually makes sense and is true. Uh, but but um, you know and that you know I, I should certainly mention that that we have a we have a buy rating on the stock. Um, so with that, I'll thank you both for being so generous with your time. I think that we made good use of it here, uh, and I hope that investors can use this to come up to speed on the company. Uh, please reach out if you'd like to have access to our research reports, uh, and we'll provide them uh, no problem. So thank you both very much for your time. We look forward to having you here again in the future and to seeing your results this coming Monday. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Cheers. Bye -bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye.